Okay, uh, so good evening. I'm going to wait just a few seconds to see if uh, anybody's able to log on and watch this. Uh, and uh, we'll get started. Posted the notes earlier. Uh, they'll be on Facebook and of course they're always on the website. And as always, this will uh, end up going onto YouTube at some stage when I get around to doing that. So, there you have it. And that's about seven o'clock. So, we'll get started. And um, this evening I wanted to focus on the question of sort of when scripture quotes scripture. Uh, which doesn't happen in most books because of course uh, most books are not written across conservatively seven uh, six hundred years uh, and um, referencing perhaps you know sort of 16 17 1800 years of history uh, you know there, there are some estimates that go the oldest parts of the Bible we are closer to the New Testament than some of the oldest parts of the Bible. That's a bit of a push, I reckon, but it's still pretty impressive. And so what you get is you get different parts of the Bible referencing other parts of the Bible. Um, and it, it happens all over the place. It happens in the Old Testament. It happens in the New Testament. Um, you, you have you know, the prophets referring to the Torah, those sorts of things. And in most Bibles, uh, you'll actually sort of see little cross-references and things that bounce around to, to show you where they're referencing things to. Uh, and uh, if you've got the notes, I actually just took a picture of my Bible, uh, NRSV Bible, and um, I highlighted the cross-references. Mine are in a little thin, narrow strip, so I've got two sort of wider strips for where the text goes. Uh, and... Um, then like a little narrow strip with references. And uh, what I did, uh, just to kind of show you, is I used the super fancy highlighter tool on my computer and I highlighted. And the yellow highlights are all pointing to Old Testament passages. And I just opened that up to Luke's Gospel. Um, it's all, it, it, you know, when this is done, go and grab your Bible and check. Often they're down the bottom, but most Bibles will have those kind of back references all through them, all through them, sort of referring to other parts of the Bible. Um, and it, the easiest way to split it up is to go, when is it referring in the New Testament? When is it referring to something in the New Testament? When is it referring to something in the Old Testament? And the reason I would split it that way is that... Uh, if you've got in the New Testament two things referring to each other, then quite possibly you've got something like in the Synoptics where Matthew will be telling the story and Mark will be telling the story and you've got a common source, in this case probably Mark's Gospel, um, or the common source of the event in question. So you get that kind of uh, referencing back to a common element. But when the New Testament references the Old Testament, uh, it does so in a different way. It actually references the Old Testament as Scripture, in the same way as we might reference Scripture. And, you know, we do it in all sorts of uh, contexts. Oh, I was going to say, there are an awful lot of them. Uh, so there are various different graphics you can find on the internet that'll show you all the cross references and things like that and some of them are interactive and you can actually look at them and stuff like that they're pretty cool um, I found one there uh, it's on the notes and uh, 340,000 biblical cross references so obviously there's a lot yeah there's a lot of these kind of references backwards and forwards which is fine uh, it's interesting um, uh, when people do it these days, when, when, when someone references the Bible these days, uh, say in a movie or, or something like that, kind of in a 
popular culture sort of picture. Um, what they're trying to do generally is to perhaps foreshadow, tell you something that's coming up, or give you a context or, or something. Essentially what they're doing is they're evoking a story, so they are uh, bringing with it a whole bunch of themes and ideas that we already have. I kind of went with one fairly classical literature moment, uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, because I thought that was interesting, you know. Uh, Oscar Wilde's not necessarily the most deeply religious and pious man, um, <laughs> but he reference it makes a lot of biblical references all over the place. And if you read the picture of Dorian Gray, it starts in this beautiful idy idyllic scene. You've got these people, there's trees. It's a, it's a it's a Garden of Eden reference. And it tells you that but a couple of things. One, there's going to be a snake or a serpent or a, or a temptation. There's all sorts of things happening in the picture of Dorian Gray right in that scene that kind of foreshadow how the story is going to go. It's a deliberate reference and it tells you what's coming to a certain extent. It's foreshadowing. Um, another reference uh, in, in Harry Potter, which has obviously sort of become a major uh, cultural uh, phenomenon with all sorts of uh, spin-offs and merchandising and movies and all the rest of it. Harry ends up going to um, a, a cemetery and on, the on some of the gravestones there are scripture passages quoted. One of the scripture passages quoted is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, and it's something along the lines of the final thing to be overcome is death. And that little passage there is J.K. Rowling indicating that the final thing that Harry's going to have to defeat is death itself. But perhaps that it can be defeated. Um, and if you know the, if you, if you know the story, uh, spoilers if you, if you haven't had a chance to read it. But in the end, Harry does die. But in dying, he defeats Voldemort and is then brought back to life. So... I hope I didn't spoil the end for you, but it's been out for a couple of years now, so you've you've had a chance to watch it. So, in kind of popular culture, we get these scriptural references and allusions all the time, and in a way, they they work in the same way as often as scriptural references do in the New Testament. That is, they they bring in with them a whole kind of set of ideas and emotions and 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 sort of the overarching story, uh, and for me. Um, perhaps one of the most strongest places for that is Jesus qu uh, quoting the Psalms on the cross. And, you know, the Psalms are a place of torment and pain and hope and, uh, and despair and affirming the presence and love of God, even when you can't feel it. And it's, that's powerful stuff. I don't, think it's, I don't think in that place Jesus is trying to do sort of finely nuanced theology. It's in a, it, it, he is bringing with him this passionate story uh, and he's sharing that um, you know I don't, I, and clearly that resonated with people because it's 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 written in there of course um, you also get people who are kind of professionally religious uh, academic scholars um, and they will also make scriptural references all the time um, and uh, what, I actually thought I'd grab a kind of a very sort of modern-esque uh, version thereof. And so um, one of the people I follow is a public theologian uh, called Miroslav Volf. He's, a, um, he's a, in one sense, he's a very orthodox, he's kind of traditional Protestant theologian. He has a very strong interest in kind of the integrated human being. But he also, he'll put little little theological ideas out on Facebook in a very public forum. But he's also, you know, um, as an academic, I'm going to say I think Yale, but he's, he's in one of those Ivy League universities. He's like the the super chair of theology and stuff like that. I, um, I, probably not super chair. Um, I think they call them the emeritus professor of whatever, um, of theology usually. So as an academic, he is 
top notch. Um, but he does the same thing, where he will make these scriptural references and allusions, uh, and he, he's, he's making a point. And so the, the obvious question then becomes, well, I, I think it's an obvious question, uh, is when we come across these things in the Bible, what do we do with them? Um, and so the first thing I would suggest is that if you come across it, uh, and you want to kind of do the deeper digging, the thing to do is follow the reference. See what's being evoked. You know, um, go and have a look and see what story's being evoked so that you you know the, the background context to the conversation. You know what's being pointed to. And then we get to um, the sort of three ways that we can... Uh, that, that scripture and, and, and us can deal with that quotation of scripture. So um, the first is, is kind of just as a broad affirmation. Does, does that make sense? So essentially, uh, well, um, I, I grabbed an excerpt there from Matthew chapter 29. Um, and there's a whole bunch of references to the Old Testament. Uh, and the, the, I'll, I'll read the passage for you in case you don't have the notes there. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Jesus, a teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So um, that's primarily a reference to Deuteronomy chap chap yeah. chapter 6, verse 5, uh, sometimes called the Shema, uh, and Levit Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And what Jesus is doing is he's, he's taking these two passages, and he is taking them, and he's saying, yes, uh, just yeah, that. Uh, it doesn't need expansion or referencing or, or, or anything. It's like those two passages are the answer to that question. And I think, it's my suspicion, uh, that most Christians, when they kind of do scriptural quotations and allusions, uh, that that's kind of how it, it operates for them. Um, they'd say, you know, well, the Bible says this, uh, and then so that's that's what I believe. Um, and, and look, that's you know, Jesus did that some of the time, uh, you know. Uh, Paul, by the way, does the same thing some of the time. Uh, so in Romans chapter 4, we get, For what does the scripture say? does the Bible tell us? Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he's basically quoting Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. And he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. So this is a very common way of reading Bible. But it's not the only way. So um, I came across this idea uh, listening to someone talking about improv comedy. And the point, one of the tools that they use in improv comedy is this idea of yes and. So uh, let's say you've got a couple of people and you're doing a scene and somebody's acting out, getting into a car, uh, running and getting into a car. To say yes and is to run as well, get into the imaginary car, and then maybe um, put a police siren on top of the car and start making a noise so that you're police officers chasing someone. It, it's the idea of working, affirming, starting from a place of affirmation and then expanding and moving on and adding to. Uh, and I think this is a really important thing. So uh, in... Luke's Gospel, we get the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is an example of yes and. 
Because in Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus is asked the same question, greatest commandments, same answer, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Ah, but who's my neighbor? You remember this. And then he tells the story, the, the, the parable that's often called the Good Samaritan. So there's a kind of an and. There's an expanding or a deepening of the idea. Uh, and it's, it's the yes and. Now, I remember going to a lecture whew, a long time ago now um, by a, an English theologian who was out in Australia and he was snagged for a conference I was going to uh, by the name of Richard Burridge, the Reverend, I think he's a canon, Reverend Canon Richard Burridge. Uh, very smart guy. Side note, he told a story about doing his PhD thesis uh, and he did a statistical analysis of the Gospels to demonstrate that the, and by how much, as a percentage, the focal point of the Gospels was Jesus. Because, um, you know, <laughs> like he, he, he broke it down into Greek and oh, yeah, very, very sort of academic smart guy. But also uh, very grounded in kind of how do you deal with things. And he was talking about if Christians want to make a, uh, an ethical response to a situation, whatever the situation is, first thing you have to do is you have to kind of try and tease out to look at the topic, um, whatever it might be, uh, and ask some very deep questions so you find the ethical core. So, uh, for example, uh, I, think, I think when he was talking to us, he was used as an example euthanasia which is a big topic and it's a very complex the uh, ethical and theological topic and he said you know when you really look at it uh it's essentially a top the question is how do we approach the value of life how do we value life which is a beautiful phrasing so once you've got that question what you then do is you go to the scriptures and you ask, and he's, and he's, and he's very explicit, you, you first ask the question, did Jesus answer that question? Uh, did Jesus answer the question in the explicit teaching? Did Jesus answer the, the question in sort of kind of in parables and in life and in action and those sorts of things? And then you move out from that. But you cast a very wide net. But you also ask, so, so in that question, say, of euthanasia or, you know, in modern context, same-sex marriage? Uh, or the Black Lives Matter movement that is so kind of got a lot of people worked up at the moment. Um, the question is, you know, none of those questions had a, an exact corollary in ancient times. Uh, Same-sex marriage, as we understand it, was not a thing that they had a concept for in, in ancient times. Uh, Black Lives Matter not a thing they had a concept for in, in ancient times. Uh, all those sorts of things. They just didn't... It wasn't a factor in their world. Um, social media. Not a thing they had a context for in, in their time. You, you see what I'm saying? So we have to ask a yes and question. And it's really important that we understand that that's what we're doing. That we're actually asking a yes and question. Um... And the first thing is just, just to be honest and say, that's a legitimate approach to Scripture. Jesus did it. Now, Jesus did it carefully, with wisdom, knowing Scripture well, but Jesus did it. So that gives us, in a sense, uh, scriptural permission for doing it too. And I want to move on to what is, I think, the third option for for quotations of scripture and I would suggest that for myself and for many other Christians it's perhaps the hardest um, and that's the yes but uh, and Jesus does it though you know so so if Jesus does it as a teacher he, he gives us a model um, in Matthew chapter 5 43 to 44 um, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
You see, Jesus is saying, this is what you've heard, but I'm saying this. And I'm saying this with a certain sense of authority. Now, he's saying that as a teacher, and he's perhaps, uh, you know, he, he's drawing on a broader scriptural reference and basis and those sorts of things. But there's a place for saying, yes, but. But that's a hard place for for us to come to who take scripture seriously. And I was thinking, you know, when, when, when you see Jesus' quote being put into action, um, you know, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the first thing that came to my mind were those pictures of Christians protecting Muslims at prayer and Muslims protecting Christians at prayer. And in much of the world, Muslims have persecuted Christians and Christians have persecuted Muslims. And it hasn't been a, uh, a happy relationship. <laughs> and yet those actions of loving the, essentially loving your enemy, praying for and alongside those who have persecuted you, is a very powerful declaration of, of, of the role of God to transform. And so this, there, there, there is precedent, and there's precedent that in our experience has borne significant fruit. I was thinking of an example, you know, where's an example where it would be, in a sense, comfortable for us to say, yes, but no. Um, and I think slavery is one of the, the examples that most people would be able to get on board with without too much difficulty. So in Timothy, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, what you get is you get, let all who are under the yoke of slavery regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be blasphemed. So in the letter to Timothy, we have a clear um, scriptural affirmation of the institution of slavery. Uh, you know, it goes on, you know, if, you're, if your master is also a, a Christian, you know, don't, don't just assume that because you're both Christians, you can kind of get all chummy with him. He's still your owner. Um, so that tells us that both slaves and masters were Christians. People who were Christians owned other Christians. And that, that was acceptable, uh, at least in the letter to Timothy. And I feel like most of us would go, yes. In that, yes, that happened. You know, there's clear historical evidence that it happened. Um, but no. no. But no, no. Uh, you know, when we look deeper, when we enter deeper into Scripture, when we start to think about how Scripture talks about the valuing of life, all those sorts of things, we have to say no. And perhaps thinking of a yes and, I would suggest that by extension, um, we, you know, in terms of the slavery thing, not only should we say no to slavery, but we should also be looking very seriously at systems uh, that rely on or cause exploitation. So, scripture on scripture, as in scripture quoting scripture. Yes, yes and, or yes but. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know, the thing about but is ignore what I just said in a, in a way <laughs> we are saying, yes, ignore the bit where the yes and the yes, but acknowledges that perhaps doesn't endorse. Um, whereas the yes would endorse. Absolutely. Uh, I hope that, um, uh, gives you something to think about. Um, a little bit to ponder. I did have one more ref. Uh, thing that I wanted to share with you. It's not in my notes because I thought of it afterwards. So uh, another lecture I went to, and I was thinking about this in terms of when we um, make scriptural references and allusions. Uh, um, I went to something, and uh, the guest speaker, one of the guest speakers, was a member of clergy from the Church of Holy Innocence in the, in America. And he was telling the story of that when the church was named, it, the Holy Innocents in this case uh, references the story of those children who were executed 
uh, when Jesus was an infant, you know, so um, the soldiers are sent to, to, to Bethlehem, kill all the babies under the boys under the age of four, that kind of thing. The holy innocents. Um, and then it was named that because a statement was being made about this is this church is for those who are um, the victims, the innocent victims of oppression. They are the holy innocents. And as time had gone on, the church had gone through various different journeys uh, and had kind of become, in a sense, a fortunate, but just in, 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 a, way, in a way, a kind of a generic uh, sort of city parish. And they recognized that they'd perhaps lost some of their, their spirit, their charism, uh, the, the spirit with the spirit of God with them. And what they did is they actually went back to the name. They went back to the reference. And they said, if we are the church of the holy innocents, then we need to proclaim loudly on behalf of those who are victims, uh, particularly the child victims of systems and structures. And that that had renewed the spirit in the church and in the community. Uh, because that story, they reconnected themselves, in a sense, to that story of, of the holy innocents and the, the despair at that. So, um, there we go. I hope you found that interesting. Um, I'll have a quick look, uh, see if any questions have come up. Um, Let's see if I can find it on here, because I don't get the questions on my phone. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay. Oh, there we go. there's some comments. Uh, David, Greg, Andrew. Oh, Greg is suggesting um, uh, that perhaps we should look at some modern questions using Burridge's process. Yeah, we could do that. That'd be interesting. Um, and uh, the, the difference between, between being a slave to God, which is without exploitation, uh, and the exploitation in, in the uh, kind of more traditional economic structure. Yes, Greg, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah, we could have a look at the... Some of the more modern questions using Burrage's system. Uh, why not? I've got the notes somewhere. Um, he's actually got a got some stuff. I actually think I might have posted a link to uh, a PowerPoint that he did that's available. So you know you can go have a look. Ah. More opportunity, and, and uh, Alex has said, thanks, Andrew, more opportunity to let scriptures sit like prose. Yeah, I, I, I partially that's what I was thinking about when I was thinking of the references, just sort of letting it sit with us um, and how people do references these days. Look, if you come up with any other questions, post them. If you other topics, I'm going to take that one on board, Greg. Um, I'll chat to you personally. Maybe we'll come up with one or two interesting questions. Uh, in the modern context and see if we can do some kind of pulling apart and follow Burridge's process to see what that has to say uh, as an ethical response. Um, other than that, I'm going to say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Good night and thank you. Bye.